So basically, when should you care? Why is network science awesome? In which context is it awesome? It can be exploratory, it can be uh, simulation based. I talk to a lot of colleagues who are interested in doing network science within their own research context, but are not sure whether it's actually appropriate uh, and why exactly they think they need to do network science in, in their research context. There's a number of arguments that I hear very often. One of those is, I, as an archaeologist, am interested in past social networks or some sort of past network, however I define it, something, some past phenomenon that I conceptualize as a network. Another common argument is um, I have multiple site assemblages and I assume that similarity in site assemblages is an indicator of frequency of interaction between people, for example. Or just relationships in general. Archaeologists saying, I think past relationships matter. I think some sort of relationships are important for me to understand the archaeological record. Now, those are things that I have definitely said in the past, but they are not good enough to motivate the adoption of a particular formal technique, let alone to identify the most appropriate sub-technique in that big toolbox that we have available to us. And network science itself is, is a massive toolbox. So, why should we care? Well, the answer is actually when relationships matter within our research context, but in a very, very specific way. We need to tie down exactly what we mean by those relationships, and we need to formalize those relationships. If we do that in a particular way, then we are able to identify what is the most appropriate network science technique to apply within our research context to answer our research questions. If we go through that process and it's a, it, 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 it turns out that actually relationships don't matter in my research context, then for, just forget about it, do something else. It's a better spending of your time. Okay, there's three ways in which relationships can matter in a way that you can formalize, and I'd like to illustrate this through this analogy. So we have a stick figure that represents an individual human, and we have some information about this human. It's basically attribute information. So we have a name, the person is Julia, she's female, she's a Roman, she doesn't have a profession, she has a certain income and she has one child. Now there's one type of relationship that we already can see here in this attribute information when we're only considering one entity. And that is the dependency of one piece of information on another, the dependency of one attribute on another. So um, the fact that Julia doesn't have a profession um, or the fact that she has a certain income is dependent on her profession, so the income will be low. So there's a dependency here between two pieces of attribute information. That's one way in which relationships can matter. A second one is when we introduce a second entity, uh, and we have similar information about that entity. So the person is called Julius. He's Roman, he's male, he has a profession, and he's a trader, and he has a different income than Julia and also one child. Now, we see the same kind of dependency here when we just look at the attribute information of Julius. So the income of Julius will be dependent on his profession as a trader. But there's a different type of information and dependency we see here. We also draw a line between Julius and Julia. Let's assume this is a romantic relationship. Um, the last piece of information, the one child, that's a piece of attribute information that cannot be explained just with reference of the, to the information of one individual. So Julia cannot just, um, or definitely a Roman Julia, could not just have conceived a child on their own. Someone else needed to be involved. In this case, it was Julius. So that piece of attribute information is dependent on the existence of a relationship between two entities. It's a different type of dependency, a different type in which, a way in which relationships matter. So that's two. Now the third one. Let's introduce a third Roman called Marcus. He's male, he's also a trader and has a certain income. Now there's a lot of lines drawn here. Uh, those relationships, let's just assume now they are, French, uh, they are, they are friendship relationships or commercial uh, contacts. These people know each other if there's a line between them. Now there is a different type of dependency represented here. Assume that blue line is not there, the arrow is not there. So Julius friends with Julius and Julius is friends with Marcus. Now we can, within our research context, if we say social networks in the past is what I'm interested in, and my hypothesized social mechanism for the functioning and creation of those social networks is the idea that um, a fr uh, people who have mutual friends will become friends themselves in the future. If that is the case, in this scenario, we expect Marcus to become friends with Julia in a future time step. 
If we hypothesize something like that, we basically formula, uh, formulate a third way in which relationships can matter. Because the existence of a relationship is dependent on the existence of other relationships in this network. So the creation or non-creation of a relationship between Marcus and Julia will be dependent on the existence of other relationships in that network. So relationships affect each other. This is a third type of dependency, a third type in which relationships can matter. Now, if you can come up with answers to these three questions, if you can formalize, for, formalize within your research context ways in which relationships matter and use this kind of vocabulary to come up uh, with these uh, ways in which dependencies might exist within your research context, then network science is the way to go for you. Uh, the way in which you define those relationships and the way in which they affect each other will determine which network science technique is the most appropriate technique. And you're not the only one doing this. Uh, there's loads of archaeologists who are interested in, in this, and there are awesome books that are just published. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much. I don't know if anyone noticed, but the, the reference on the previous slide was a paper called What is Network Science? published in the clearly first issue of the first volume of a journal, Network Science. I think this is very appropriate. It's very appropriate, actually. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, so actually, just that qualifier, the entire argument I gave here is the argument that is made way more successfully in more than five minutes in that paper, which is free to download minutes, as well. Eight minutes. Sorry for that. All right, networks. Comments, questions. What do you These think are simulation and networks, Tom? Well, like basic based modeling and networks, like. So I was, I was really interested in Elizabeth's slide because I was kind of trying to figure out, I was like, oh shit, I'm next, and I've got to position myself somewhere on that particular slide. I'm glad it's not up anymore because I think it would come somewhere um, uh, along like with the cellular automata and the, and the ABM, maybe just as a third category or something. Um, because network science incorporates a vast uh, number of techniques and some of them are simulation-based, others are not. Um, Network science is really just a bunch of techniques that uh, allow you to deal with network data. And network data is a formal representation of those three ways in which relationships can matter. So the simulation angle, though, uh, is, is very big in network science. And there's two uh, big families uh, within that. There's a body of techniques that uh, simulate processes within which networks are generated. They can either be uh, deterministic, uh, so you just assume uh, this social mechanism that I mentioned just now, for example, and that just leads, given a certain agent set and given a certain seed relationship, gives rise to a certain pattern. Um, or they can be stochastic, uh, and there are, there are many actor-oriented uh, stochastic network models that are basically in the AD, ABM uh, you know, uh, category. And then the second body of techniques are those that assume the existence of a network and that uh, simulate social mechanisms on top of the network. And that's generally, you know, other people do these kind of things. Uh, but so I don't think there's any need for making a distinction there. I think network science in part is just simulation when it's appropriate to do so. A question to complexity science specialists. Why are is network science considered part of complexity science? Well, network science is considered part of complexity science because a lot of the time relationships have cascading effects. When you interact with another human being, that's going to cause you to modify your own behavior potentially, and that's going to cause bigger effects down the road. And so it's really important to, to be able to understand those interactions between human beings or whatever entity you're studying to understand how that can change in the system. For example, okay, this is, I just came up with a terrible example, but let's say that I'm leading this group here and all of a sudden I die of a heart attack, right? So we're taking me out of the equation. We have a network here where maybe you all are dependent on me for information. Maybe I'm the only one who knows where lunch is. And then all of a sudden I die and so I am the important person here who is going to not have that information. If someone else drops dead of a heart attack, 
this is a terrible example, but if someone, but it's a common example in a network where you want to see who is the most connected individual, who has the most information, and whether or not they're really important. And then there are individuals who don't have that information. And so if someone else were to, you know, just get up and leave, it wouldn't be as dramatic as if I were to get up and leave, kind of thing. So that's why it fits in complexity science, because you're trying to understand how individuals affect the whole system and how those cascading effects can happen. I'm not dying of heart attack.